Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. Today we're covering women's rights or human rights, CSW's annual global gathering for gender justice. And we just recently concluded the 65th session of the Commission on Status of Women with the theme, women's full and effective participation in decision-making in public life and the empowerment of women and girls. We are very fortunate to be here with three amazing advocates who are very active in New York and around the world to ensure gender is a global issue and to make sure that the world is a better place. I'd like to thank you so much for coming and Hori, could you share with us a little bit about some of the accomplishments of the most recent CSW and what has been accomplished? Thank you for having us, Joshua. It's always good to see you and it's too bad that it's on little screens this year, but it, this is exactly what we accomplished this year. We actually pulled off one of our largest gatherings ever during a pandemic, completely 100% virtual. So NGO CSW, which is NGO Committee on Status of Women is tasked to bring women and girls voices to the United Nations once a year during the Commission on the Status of Women. So the commission is a, a, a set of member state bureau members who meet for two weeks and bring the gender equality topic, whatever priority theme they have chosen to the United Nations. And NGO CSW's task is to bring the voices to the member states. So this year, because of the pandemic, we decided to go 100% virtual and we started actually planning six months ago and reached out to our global sisters. And believe it or not, we were able to gather 25,000 advocates on a virtual platform to really convey what they wanted from member states. Now, do we get what we want is a different topic. But for now, I can tell you that we are very proud what we've been able to achieve. We had about 700 events, um, you know, what we call parallel events, meaning we discussed the topics amongst civil society and high level members. And we bring the results of that to member states, which Susan, my past chair, will tell you more about. Um, so perhaps I can pass it on to Susan now, how we bring the advocacy to member states. Well, where to start? I do want to emphasize the 27,000. And be, it's because the 20, uh, really 27,000, 26,000 participants. And it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for COVID. I swear, because it was called off last year and we were determined that it would happen. But the excitement was that this year it was global. New York has run everything and taken responsibility for everything. And this time it, we thought it'll be much stronger if it's global. So all the work we did in terms of our advocacy research to prepare for the negotiated document and do our own recommendations took part with seven sister NGO CSWs meeting at, well, in New York, it was like seven in the morning. It wasn't so bad. In Australia, it was maybe midnight, but we had it, um, it was ter terrific. We had you know, people from Lebanon, from, from Ghana, from Argentina, from the Caribbean, um, where else? Oh, Vienna and, and, and the Geneva and New York. And I probably left someone out. But it was so exciting learning from them. We also had young people on, on it, on, on, on the meetings. We would meet every two weeks. We started in October, if you can believe this. We got to know each other and we worked on the priority theme that Josh already said, um, which is the participation of women in um, public life, but also in the violence against women in public life. And so we took the UN Women Concept Note, the, the six areas, and we looked at it in terms of the situation, facts and data, but regionally. And so what Africa was, Africa was saying was different from Lebanon, which was different from, from Geneva. Um, we looked at precedence in human rights, being the Beijing Platform for Action, CEDAW, all kinds of things, because we're always told you must argue from precedent we looked at good practices, what has been accomplished 
that we might be able to, to spread, you know, that we learn from a certain country and what they've done and why can't we do it here? And then recommendations, what is needed. And when I speak next time, I'll talk about the United States and the briefing and how happy we are that we once again have an ambassador that makes sense. Susan, that's a really great point. I remember being there uh, two years ago in the negotiations where they would come out of the room and you'd get the text and then everybody would go, oh, and then recommit though, and put more paragraphs, more language and try to get the right text back in. And of course we could see even at the recent Universal Periodic Review when they did a Geneva Declaration, the US had been heading in the wrong direction on women's rights. So it is good to have the 65th session. It's great that at this principal global intergovernmental body exclusively dedicated to promotion of gender equality and empower women that you could say we've turned in that direction. And Safira, can you share with us a bit from your perspective what it was like to participate and some of the gains in that document that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, as you were saying, you know, the, the focus of the commission, I mean, really is to document the reality of women's lives throughout the world and shape these global standards on gender equality and the empowerment of women. And so I, I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, kind of the role of young people. So I'm currently serving as a co-chair of the Youth Leaders and Young Professionals um, program of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women. And something that was really unique about this particular commission with the virtual kind of platform was that many, many more young people had access for the first time to be able to participate. Um, and so in terms of being able to contribute to this outcome document, um, we were able to work with Susan and a, and a small team of young people that were really trying to pull together the lived experiences of young people on the ground. And I think um, part of this, of course, young people bringing this diversity of perspective um, to these international negotiations, but also in many ways when it comes to gender equality, young people are really at the forefront of some of these social spaces where shifts around gender equality need to take place. So for example, in the realm of technology, online with social media, you've got young people working in schools or youth clubs where like really early social understandings of gender equality and stereotyping takes place that people then carry with them for the rest of their lives. So they're, they're playing some really essential um, roles and, and sharing some really essential perspectives to that conversation um, and being able to, you know, share this enthusiasm and, and humility and this willingness to learn, um, but as well as really leading certain communities and rallying people around social change and leading that change. Um, so we were able to send out a survey and really kind of collect much of this experience and what young people are spearheading at the grassroots level, at the national level, regional, international levels, um, really active, outstanding young people doing some really fantastic things. And then to be able to feed that into the document um, and some of that negotiations, which we were able to during the CSW and part of the NGO forum was to set up these informal spaces where civil society could meet with member states and consult with them about certain aspects of the document, language, certain um, points of contention that could really be um, shared and negotiated throughout those two weeks. So um, it was really wonderful to have this opportunity really for the first time for young people to be incorporated in, um, in the commission in this way. Thank you so much, Safira. And we know the CSW is really instrumental in promoting women's rights, documenting the reality of women's lives throughout the world and shaping global standards on gender equality and the empowerment. And Huri, you were talking earlier about really coming up with some of those promising practices that are taking place around the planet. Could you maybe share where some of those stories from women coming forward of what has worked and how that thing could be either scaled up and we could all be solutionaries regarding the important issue on women's rights? Yes, actually, that's such a good point to really unpack even more so this year, right? Because we know that locally, women have found solutions just out of necessity. I mean, when you think about what women have achieved even in this pandemic, right? How they have risen up and taken care of not only what they usually take care of, and then on top of that, what they have to do. And, and again, 
Um, it's something that we know instinctively what is necessary for our family, for our community. And then it's really important to keep bringing that up and bringing it to the international level. And what happened was that because of, just like Susan said, because of the um, virtual capacity, we were able to connect locally and nationally throughout our consultancy while we were doing advocacy. But also at the same time, because we did not have access to member states, because usually on a normal um, year, we would have meetings with member states, but everybody was working from home. And many member states members were not even in their offices or even in New York City. So we, we kind of activated our local activists to work from the national level for the first time instead of just the global level. And it actually was something really important because we've always said global is local and local is um, global, but this year actually we were forced to use that in our leading up to CSW um, because it's unfortunate that, you know, yes, we had a consensus, the outcome document was at least there was a consensus, but it wasn't strong enough. We're still not very happy how member states are behaving around gender equality. The, the, the language that they're using is not strong enough. And there's pushback from certain governments and, uh, and you, United States was one of them actually, even last year and this year, and I'll let Susan tell you more about that. But, but it's really important to notice how, how we can't just take member states for what they're coming up with on, on, on the document for their word value, right? We need to bring that into implementation and accountability. And that only happens at the local and national level. So there's this back and forth and give and take. But I do want to pick up one more thing that Safira said, which we're so excited. And you probably know this because you've been there. The meetings at the Vienna Cafe. So we, we were not able to meet with them in their missions ahead of time to advocate. We were not able to meet with them in the lobbies or the corridors of the UN. So NGO CSW actually created the space, we called it the Virtual Vienna Cafe and invited member states to speak to us. And I'm so happy to say at least six member states showed up. And of course they were the progressive member states, right? Canada, um, Chile, um, Costa Rica. I mean, it was wonderful to have that interaction and, and they listened to us but also their hands are tied. They were like, yes, but Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, they're pushing back on language that we're, we want to be more progressive in. Susan, perhaps you, you can join in and talk a little bit about how proud we are of US this year, finally. <laughs> um, there's so much I want to say. Um, I have, as you've been talking, I've been um, uh, jotting down things. We are going to take the advocacy research group. We'll take a very close look at, um, at the agreed conclusions and then take a look at our recommendations and then see how much it, it, it is just, uh, uh, they wanted to get it done and so they all um, gave in too much. But we'll be doing that the second week in April. Um, and when Josh asks, well, what changes have happened? Well, one change I think there, there are more women in government now. And I, I saw that And the latest, um, what is it called? In, uh, Interparliamentary Union or one of the IPU report did talk about how there were, uh, there's more women participation. And we had some of the um, women in the advocacy group talking about it um, in Ghana. Um, and and that was, it was quite exciting. The United States has gone down to 67 in women's participation, which is pretty shocking. However, the IPU did say the violence against women parliamentarians has grown a lot. And so we did do, we did a session on um, violence against women parliamentarians. Um, we actually had a parliamentarian from South Sudan and she said it wasn't too bad there. I mean, men were a little sexist, but at least they weren't violent. But. Um, <laughs> And we had Canada, Armenia, um, Philippines, and it was quite exciting and a, an amazing audience um, talking. And of course, I tried to get AOC, but um, 
you know, uh, I tried hard, uh, but I think she was just too bruised and too confused. And, and uh, may, I think maybe next year we can get her. But now like the third thing, what did you want me to talk about? Oh, you want to talk about the ambassador? Well, it took a long time for her to get, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of the buildup before she got um, confirmed, but she's excellent. She has a state, uh, been in the State Department a lot. Um, she's African-American. Um, she's just decent and reaches out to NGO, um, NGOs. So that I, I like a lot. And so she had a briefing with about a hundred of us and all of the people, there were all kinds of people Courtney, who was one of the head um, negotiators, was there, and we could put in all kinds of, uh, not that things got in necessarily, but we gave all kinds of language, and um, there was quite a range. And for once, it wasn't all the NGOs that are on the right. It was a lot of progressive NGOs, and they seemed so happy and so supportive. And so we will start meeting with them soon. Um, and, and I look forward to that. There's something called the US Caucus, and they have a, um, a meeting, a, a group that has to do with ad, um, ad advocacy. And Erica, the co-chair of the advocacy research with me um, is on that committee and I hope to get on it soon so that we can start meeting with the US mission soon. Um, because so much in the, in, the, um, in the UN is done through relationships. I mean, and this year it was so hard to have relationships. I mean. I, I, but I do appreciate your story about creating the virtual Vienna Cafe. Uh, for the UPR of the United States, we created a virtual serpentine sessions in Geneva. <laughs> and we even put up a picture of Mont Blanc as like the backdrop. So we do like, bonjour, welcome. So it's so good to see the ingenuity of international NGOs coming together to, as you said, really build that relationship. And I know, Susan, you didn't get AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but you did have the Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, maybe, yes. Sabir, you could share if you thought that was exciting. And also another exciting aspect is really when we look at COVID, it was the young female leaders. So people have said, you know, the future is female. And looking at New Zealand, Aotearoa, looking at the Scandinavian countries, those young female leaders, prime ministers, is that inspiring to you? And how can you see that trend coming with more young women coming in to uh, really uh, take on what uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said is the unfinished human rights struggle of this century? Yeah, this is great. And, and I think just to touch on this, the overall feel of the commission this year it had definitely had a very distinctive tone where maybe it was COVID, maybe it was just the virtual style of um, engaging, but definitely a high level. Like there are many, of course, every year, many government delegations and ministers who do come to the commission, but really at the higher, higher level um, this year was, was very noticeable. And to have Kamala Harris kind of speak, you know, the vice president of a nation to come, it's, she's the highest level um, representative of the US government, at least to speak. So it was a really historic moment for the US to have Kamala Harris address the commission. Um, but then also I feel to have exactly this example of young female leaders um, around the world who have really been very thoughtful and have been able to lead their um, nations in ways that have been um, really economically smart, stable, and you can see the trends. And I think this was a real theme over the course of the commission as we've been looking at these qualities of leadership. Um, where it's, of course, this representation, and it is very inspiring to see kind of young women in these roles, but then also focusing on the qualities and what is distinct about the character, the qualities, um, the way that they govern, the ways that they're thinking about these issues and really having the well-being of the whole of the population at heart. I think that was very much a, um, a, a theme or ideas that emerged from what was contributed. And I think also what was distinct for me about a lot of the discussion and contributions during the CSW was this real sense of solidarity and a lot of discussion around how to build back better after COVID. Um, much acknowledgement that as we've seen 
during COVID, you know, women really rise to these standards of leadership and where we've seen it, they've really shined. Um, but that also that women and girls especially are carrying so much of the burden and are suffering so much because of the implications of COVID. So that really felt like a theme that shone through and to feel this really so strong sense of solidarity on the part of the international community of how we're going to do this together was, was very inspiring. And what, of course, for human rights defenders, there's no rest uh, already. You're very much involved with the next step called Generation Equality Forum. And we know that Mexico and France are hosting this UN forum to accelerate the agenda laid out 26 years ago at the Beijing Women's Conference. Uh, can you maybe share a bit about what's going on right now virtually in Mexico and then when that'll then be followed up in France and, and some of the next steps of, of what we can imagine with international advocacy? Corey? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it actually also ties into what I was saying earlier, because no matter how hard we push as civil society, member states are still pushing back and not delivering implementa implementation of the documents that they're agreeing upon. So UN Women decided that they were going to start so what I would call is like a parallel campaign to CSW. It is very similar. It is based on the Beijing Platform for Action, which is what CSW studies and looks into every year. But this Generation Equality Forum is meant to bring the radical progressive governments and activists and, and to come up with a blueprint to show solid results, implement, you know, what, what I call implementation within five years. So pick out six, uh, five action coalitions and women, peace and security is the sixth compact. And then to bring the strong players kind of, you know, into the team, and see how we can show the rest of UN how we can accomplish things instead of just talk, right? So, so of course, NGO CSW is supportive of that too. We are the convener of that whole movement and we are all as activists invited into that space. And you're right, we're meeting as we speak right now. The Mexico Forum ends tomorrow afternoon and it's supposed to come up with some really strong recommendations from also, uh, countries, right? Uh, progressive countries. And then we're going to bring that into Paris for commitments. So the recommendations come out of Mexico. And then we meet in, again, virtually in Paris in June. And then at that point, member states will make solid commitments with how to achieve their recommendations in five years. So it's similar to the SDGs as well, but it's mostly for obviously gender equality. Yeah, and it reminds me, I know when, they, when the forum will culminate in Paris on July 2nd, after that three-day meeting, and virtually, unfortunately, especially as we see the numbers in Paris and our heart goes out to the French with the COVID situation. Maybe we can also address, Susan, as you brought up the sustainable development goal number five, but also how it's mainstreamed across all of them. And you briefly mentioned CEDAW. I know it rhymes with hee and most people in the US aren't sure what that is. But <laughs> the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, that's a pretty dynamic body with 22 of the 23 being women in that leadership role. How do you think through the high level political forum and maybe through CEDAW, some of the important work that you started at the CSW will carry on? That's a good question. Um, Certainly, I do want to report that um, there are 50 cities in, New, in the United States that have passed um, uh, CEDAW ordinances. And to me, that's terrific because it's a knowledge and a commitment to human rights. Now, um, about the other question, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, Bandana Rana, who is, was vice chair of, uh, of CEDAR, is, is one of our co-chairs of um, uh, uh, NGO CSWO Asia Pacific. And so I keep in touch with her, but it, uh, COVID has slowed them down a bit, I think. Um, they do have things they work on, um, but we've been trying to get them to work on some other things that we're slowly trying, um, like, the, the plight of widows, and then there's a whole dossier for CEDAW and whatever globally. Um, but no, CEDAW, and because it's also um, 
it's um, what do you call it? It's a, a negotiated document that's um, binding. Um, that CEDAW is very useful and everyone should know CEDAW and read it and be able to quote it when it's necessary. Yes, no, it inspired us in Hawaii. We just concluded our 21st annual uh, Women's Rights or Human Rights Gender Justice Summit that we created on Maui uh, 21 years ago. And also our 16th annual Human Rights Day at the state legislature. And we always do that around Women's Day because it's very important to, uh, you know, when the legislature is in session and we as Hawaii, the state of Hawaii has also adopted CEDAW and so did Honolulu as a city. So we definitely think that's very valuable and important. And we see a lot of that action going out with human rights cities. Uh, in our final moments- We'll have a press release. Could you send us that press release and we'll smear it about <laughs> Hawaii being in, in, and joining that. That would be wonderful. We could give you great publicity and hope it would in, um, encourage others. Sure, no, and we just, or we just had a hearing yesterday on localizing UPR implementation as well. So we're doing our best to bring the global to the ground and the international to our islands. In our final moment, Safir, would you like to have any words about the future of women's rights and aspects that we can all concentrate on together as we coordinate through civil society and with champion countries to make the world a better place? Yeah, of course. It's um, There's a lot happening and really everything that has been described with the Commission on the Status of Women and the Generation Equality Forum, it's all about movement building. It's We're all in this together, whether it's translating the principle of gender equality in our own personal lives or whether it's kind of joining some of these more formal spaces. So I guess my final words would be get involved. There are so many, many ways, different channels, whether it's through NGO CSW or much of the civil society platforms that will continue throughout the rest of the year with the Generation Equality Forum, please look into it, reach out. And there are structures and very warm civil society members like some of these who are on the call, Huri is a wonderful chair and Susan as well, who are just ready to support and, and encourage that engagement. So, yes. Thank you so much. I know it is exciting to see what else is coming next. I am so glad to hear the Generation Equality Forum is, is very active and how it will end in July, but it's also exciting to see what else is coming up. I know the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues will begin in April, and that's a very important time as many women leaders have emerged through that space that also engage with CSW. So it's a chance to reinforce those recommendations that were uh, adopted. And then the one last thing I'd like to thank all of you is for really committing to that process that we know it's grueling. Uh, we know it all begins much earlier than just uh, the two week process that we see. And when would you say people start getting involved with the CSW for the next uh, process? And then we'll close there. When do you think people begin to get involved if they wanted to start to contact you, Hori? Well, we actually, the executive committee meets over the summer and we have our retreat to make our plans, but I would say September. Yeah. Our first meeting is the third Thursday of the month. And, but we send out information regularly. So please sign up to our email list. It's very easy on our website, ngocsw.org. Sign up for the young leaders, youth, uh, youth leaders and young professionals. That's also on our website. And as far as generation equality, it's really easy to Google and then find the website. They have a public conversation site that anybody can engage and add opinions on it so that they feel engaged. So a lot of this, and they're all available on our website too. So I guess the hub is ngocsw.org. Perfect. And that's excellent that we all know we can get involved around the UN General Assembly and then to be involved and see the results in March afterwards. So thank you all so much for making time. And thank, thank you, Joshua. Aloha, aloha.